that can take it from. I would like to first uh, thank the organizers for inviting me. Um, this is the second workshop uh, in this spirit that I'm attending. It's also a pleasure to be back uh, at my alma mater. Um, so uh, what I'm going to talk about is fracture of silicon and germanium atoms. So why silicon and germanium atoms? Most lithium ion batteries that you have right now in your, um, in your cell phones, in your Teslas, uh, they have anodes made of carbon. It's, it's graphene usually. And carbon is nice, it only expands about 2% once you try to put in lithium ions in it. But uh, carbon's um, theoretical capacity is about 400 milliampere's hours per gram. So it's very low. Uh, electrochemists, being electrochemists, looked at the periodic table and asked, OK, what is under carbon? It's silicon and germanium. Let's try to put uh, lithium in those. So uh, they do theoretical calculations of what is the theoretical capacity of these <coughs> materials, and it's an order of magnitude larger. Good news. Uh, we can have Teslas that you can put your foot on the gas pedal and it's going to accelerate even more. But the bad news is once you start putting the lithium in these lattices, in the silicon and germanium lattices, Something drastic happens. It, they start to swell. They swell somewhere between 300 to 400% when you want to push them to their theoretical capacity. They not only swell, if you start from a crystalline silicon vapor, uh, as the lithium invades, it disrupts the covalent bonds, and it makes the crystalline uh, amorphous. So uh, it becomes a, a whole new issue of how can we design uh, components or small particles for the, for the anodes in these batteries made of these materials and not let them break. And this is a, a problem. So people started doing this around 2010, 2012, or the first papers. Uh, uh, Bill Nix worked on it, uh, some other people. And uh, when we came in, uh, people understood a few things. First, as you put in the lithium, this phase change in the, in the crystal in silicon or germanium is sharp. If you look at the image on the right, you see that in a few nanometers, you start going from a crystalline structure to a, to a amorphous structure. Uh, why is that? Because silicon covalent bonds are very strong. And lithium to disrupt those uh, needs a lot of power. They, they start coming from the side of some of these uh, strong bonds to, to decouple them and to make this intermetallic alloys of silicon something lithium. OK. The second thing people uh, understood was that once these things uh, phase change, or if you start from an amorphous sample, if you litiate it and delitiate it, take everything out, the thing doesn't go back to its original form. So there is some sort of inelasticity going on. And uh, there were papers about uh, what's happening uh, and how is this making the samples fracture. So, how does the, 
does these things fracture? So uh, this is a silicon um, sphere. They litiate from top. And as you can see, the thing swells and then cracks on the outside. But on a fundamental level, if there is no inelasticity and you start putting in something that makes you expand, you are making compressive stresses on your surface, which is not something that is going to make you crack. If you do the simulations in a, in a regime that uh, you don't get any inelasticity, you get compressive stresses on the outside. So you need that inelasticity in there. OK. So I'm going to uh, commit various number of questionable choices. Uh, in the end, I'm going to get something reasonable. And then I'm going to ask myself, why did I do it? Why does this thing work? And I don't necessarily have an answer for it. So what do I do? This is uh, three to 400% volume change. So I need to do finite elasticity. Once I have finite elasticity, I want the inelasticity in there. So I go back to my mechanical or mechanics training and bring in the simplest form of finite plasticity that I can find from Simo inside. I have a background in phase field, so I put in the phase field models of uh, fracture. This is something that, uh, for example, many of the people that uh, do or did ductile fracture doing. This is something that Chad did with uh, Michael Bourdain. Uh, and then I need another part to my energy to describe this. Uh, Phase transformation. Okay? So, and then I, I do the usual thing for finite glasses. Uh, what do I need more? Okay. So, I'm making cracks. I don't want them to uh, interpenetrate. We know how to do that in uh, small strain elasticity. Uh, as I said, Chad and others did it for finite plasticity, for <coughs> uh, finite plasticity or finite strain uh, deformation. I'm, I'm using a similar idea. So I'm, I'm, I'm breaking my uh, energy into two parts, an isochoric part and a volumetric part. And I'm saying that the when the volumetric part, when the pressures are negative, I want only the isochoric part of the energy. This is, if you know the literature, this, this is the same idea that uh, people do in, in linear elasticity. But here I have another thing that because I have this phase change, my material properties are changing. Amorphous silicon is a lot more compliant by a factor of 10 to 4, depending who you ask, than the crystalline silicon or crystalline germanium. So I need my material properties to depend on that uh, phase change. And then I have a J2 plasticity that I just uh, do it the way we know how to do it. Finite classes. OK, now, uh, how does the phase change work? From outside, when you look at this phase change, you understand something very quickly. The lithium, once it comes in, the phase change is slow. But the diffusion of the lithium in the a lithium rich phase is fast. So, on a fundamental level, I should have two equations. I should have a diffusion equation and a 
phase equation. But I'm foregoing the diffusion equation, saying that the uh, chemical potential is going to uh, going to equilibrate on the time scale that I'm interested in. And then I need a mobility for because crystalline silicon, if anything, is not an isotropic. I need a mobility that depends on the structure of the crystalline silicon. Uh, what we did, we, uh, you, we essentially are using the diffusion and isotropy. The, uh, the form of the diffusion and isotropy for silicon and fitting it to the mobility and isotropy that people see in silicon. And this is uh, something that uh, we brought over from this paper by uh, Yitmin Chang and his group. So when I put all this together, I can do phase change, plasticity, and let's forego the fracture for now. So there are some uh, results before us that people used uh, abacus to do this thing. So I, I just show one comparison, two comparisons. Uh, the way uh, finite plasticity is implemented in abacus, as I understand it, is based on logarithmic stresses. <coughs> so it, it's my elasticity type is different from them, but at least at the picture level, my stresses and um, my deformation are consistent with what people did before. Okay, so let's uh, do some simple stuff first. I'm going to make the problem simple first. I want to do an axisymmetric model. I do an axisymmetric model, I start lithiating. Uh, what do I see? When my yield strength is low, I lithiate, that's the gray lines. As the lithium, as the phase boundary moves in, I yield first because of the high, high compressive stresses that are made on the surface. But as the phase moves in, those compressive stresses cre uh, create a tensile, essentially tensile eigenplastic strains in the other direction. The core has moved in, the lithium has moved in, so now I'm getting tensile stresses on the outside. And I can yield again on the outside because of those tensile stresses. If I make the yield strength larger, I can have a situation that I don't have that uh, yield. So I can construct something like this from my axisymmetric simulation. Based on what the, uh, what the yield strength of this material is, compared to one of the elastic constants of material. I'm setting everything else, that's why I have a sigma y in gigapascals. You have two situations. So at the asymptotic end, for sigma y of equal to zero, you essentially yield right away. You don't create any stresses. At sigma y equal to infinity, you're elastic. Uh, you don't have a positive maximum tau theta theta. This is the only positive. So you become elastic. Everywhere in between, you either yield twice in compression and in tension on the right hand side, or only in compression on, on the on the left hand side. So the, uh, the, when the graph is going up, it's <coughs> yielding both in compression and tension. And when it's coming down, you're yielding only in compression. And then you can do this for ho hollow <coughs> cylinders, which I will come back to. Okay. So axisymmetric is nice. Uh, let's. I can add the anisotropy. I have the machinery now uh, to do simulations of, uh, of this uh, lithium insertion. So this is a 001 direction uh, silicon. I'm 
inserting the lithium from uh, outside, which means that I'm driving my phase change variable from outside. And uh, what do I see? The thing that you see pretty quickly is that when we get a uh, compressive yield and a tensile yield, you start localizing uh, plasticity. First, you localize it because you have a uh, core that is uh, anisotropic. So if I play this again, uh, you ha your core is anisotropic. So you have corners, so that uh, creates uh, concentrations for your localiza localization. But you also localize uh, plasticity into these uh, V-shaped forms. Okay. What is the consequence of that? The consequence of that is that you get a lot more uh, bang for your buck. So you are making, because of that localization, so when you have localization, you have larger amount of that tensile uh, eigen plastic strain that you created on the surface that is helping you to create tensile stresses. So you get higher tensile stresses. Being a fracture person, what does that mean? <coughs> that means that if plasticity lives enough room for you to get high enough stresses, you're going to crack. You're cracking, and you can also crack on the other side of the, my up and down curve, what we call the window. Um, and then you can symmetry break and let two of the cracks. I'm doing these things on a one-fourth symmetry right now, so that's why you have uh, left, right, and up-down symmetry in these things. They can be a lot more complicated. But. So, okay, I have pretty pictures. We understand something, but can we do any predictions? So, as, uh, as Rani said, uh, in this type of material, going back to Griffith, for, for brittle material, you can do this Griffith argument. How much energy I'm releasing with my crack, that's my GC times a surface or a length, and how much energy that releases. That's my some stress squared divided by my elastic modulus times the volume. Okay. Uh, what uh, 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 Marigo and Fam in a series of paper have done is that they've shown for a, for a class of face field models, a very general class of face field models, you get a relationship like that that Griffith has between your uh, uh, between your strength and your GC. So your TC square over E is proportional to GC over C is my, uh, um, instead of the Griffith uh, crack length, is my process zone size. And uh, the prefactor behind this thing depends on the, on the face field model that you're choosing. Okay? Now. I need one more variable. So I need to know my C compared to my sample size. Um, if I assume that C doesn't change with my sample size, if process zone is the same in all the samples, then it shouldn't uh, matter if my silicon is a kilometer in radius or it's 100 nanometers. So what we usually do is we say, okay, let's assume that C scales also with, with my sample rate. 
And you can interpret this in different ways. You can say statistically, you're more likely to get a bigger, uh, uh, bigger flaw size. Because in, in, in this business, there is, there, is a, there is a relationship, as you see, between what Griffith did and what uh, Marigo is saying, that uh, C becomes like a flaw size for initiating a frac. So I can put all that together, and I can get a boundary. So based on what my C over R is, that's my C bar, I can tell you what is the minimum non-dimensional fracture <coughs> toughness, GC over mu R, that I can get a crack at if I have a maximum sigma theta theta that is, or tau theta theta that is some value. I can plot that all together. So uh, the crosses and the circles are my 2D simulations. The gray area is what uh, Marigold's calculation would tell us for the maximum theta, uh, tau theta theta that I'm making in, a, in 2D simulations without fracture. Uh, the dashed line is the axisymmetric. The orange line is this uh, simple it, in, in this simpler calculation that uh, Suo did in, in two papers. So Suo, Matt Ford, and uh, company did a calculation that they assume there are, uh, there is no, they essentially assume there is no elasticity. There, it's only a plastic material. So uh, what do we see from this? At lower, young, at lower yield stresses, uh, it doesn't matter if you're axisymmetric, if, you um, um, if you are uh, doing what Suo and company did. It doesn't really matter. If you are not axisymmetric, if you are at higher <coughs> yield stress, then it, it can matter a lot. And I'm plotting one more variable. In the, gr in the green shaded area, I'm plotting, uh, based on what we think GC of this material is, from basically calculations that they did based on thin film fracture, and the safe size the critical size of the, these silicon pillars that they see for this particular orientation. That's my green. So it's anticlimactic because they weren't doing that bad. I'm doing it a little bit better. So you can say, good, the facial model works within this logic. Or, uh, well, why did you waste your time? <sighs> but, so, uh, this is the thing that I think for a lot of people uh, inside and outside community is, is, is this big question. What about your C over R? What about it? So, how, how are you choosing this? Um, what I can tell from the uh, movies that we saw, and these are the best measurements that we have right now. Basically, the best measurements that we have right now from the pillars are movies of the pillars breaking, or the snapshots of pillars breaking. The cracks seem to be sharp. So I don't expect in a 100 nanometer uh, pillar the my C to be 100 nanometer. I'm expecting it to be a fraction of that. So I'm expecting my C over R to be 110, 100, something like that. So I can vary that 
and look at the same thing. Look at the, at the safe size, at my GC over mu r of what we think, uh, uh, where, the, where the safe uh, nano pillars were. I can plot this. So, what you will find out is that it seems like you have some sort of asymptote. So if you, if you just assume uh, something like Su and company assume, if you, do, if you go and read the fine print of the paper, they're assuming their Griffith cracked lens scale to be a large portion of their radius where you really don't need that. It's, it's just part of that calculation because you are simplifying so much out of the problem. So within reasonable C uh, over mu r, you can have things that, are, that can break, or let's put it this way, you can design uh, nano pillars that you think are safe but will break through. Okay. Um, I'm not gonna show this. I'm going to tell you a little bit about 3D. So, uh, all know sound well, uh, what about 3D? Pillars are not 2D. Uh, it becomes messy because when people do these pillars in 3D, you can get things that look like that. Instead of my original movie that was showing a, a wire in, in 3D that was breaking more like my, uh, uh, my 2D stuff. So we started trying to do these uh, 3D calculations, and these are uh, hot out of the oven. So we are starting to look at if the, if the poop stresses that are created between the boundary of the, your core and your amorphized silicon can give rise to fracture. I'm not going to show this. Uh, we are also interested in, uh, in uh, the alloy structures for silicon. So what they do is they make a silicon bismuth uh, alloy. They eat, uh, they, uh, I'm sorry, uh, yes, a silicon manganese alloy and they eat out the manganese with the, uh, with the bismuth melt and they get, they can get a 3D structure that of course porcelains and people are interested in seeing how these things, how these things break, uh, because in the in the uh, laboratory setting, these seem to be more robust. Okay, so in conclusion, I did J two plasticity for silicon lithiating, which is crazy. I use a very simple model of uh, phase field uh, for initiation of cracks that uh, Oscar will tell us in the afternoon that only captures a small portion of what's happening. Uh, and I, get some, I got something reasonable. So uh, J2 works, but work being an operative word, it seems to give the right ballpark of the answer. Uh, I need a lens scale to, uh, to regularize my J2 plasticity. I don't know how to do that yet. And I don't know what, how these uh, plastic uh, localizations are changing the Fama Marix type calculation. As you saw, when I did the plots, my gray area was off. That's all I have. Thank you for listening. Any questions?
questions? I have a quick question about the application, like application set or the background set. Yeah. So you said that people put the lithium uh, into the silicon cell cause these problems. What about, uh, what do people do originally with carbon? Yes, the, so the, the carbon is, when it's the anode, uh, the lithium ion battery works essentially when you charge in it by driving the lithium from the cathode to the anode. And then when you're using it, that uh, creates a, a potential that uh, drives current. So lithium goes from anode back to the cathode. Uh, and, and that's what they do. But it's 2% uh, expansion. And 2% is nothing, uh, especially in, in something like graphene that easily slides on different uh, layers. Sure. Uh, oh. One question about the numerics. Uh, yes. You said that you're doing finite deformation. Yes. Uh, do you observe any mesh distortion issues, and then how do you handle those uh, in your simulation? Because this is, I find, a key issue that happens. So, one lucky thing, <coughs> one thing that makes this problem easy is that the expansion is purely volumetric. So that pu purely being volumetric part helps. I uh, worked with uh, like B-bar type uh, anti-locking mechanisms. This, uh, the, what do you call it? The whole Washizu uh, generalizations. But they made little difference. So we didn't have much problem with, with distortions or with locking in these simulations. I have no idea if I make this 300% anisotropic, uh, meaning that it will grow in one side more than the other. I have no idea how bad it will get. That's a question that I don't know the answer to. Does that answer your question? <coughs> In some way, yeah. yeah. <laughs> All right, any other questions? No, let's thank our speaker one more time.